Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. And today we've got a special guest. Uh, we're going to be joined by Navinda Kotagay, uh, who is the principal investigator with the CSIRO. Uh, and they came second uh, late in September with the DARPA Advanced, uh, which stands for Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency or DARPA. And they came second in the final of the DARPA Subterranean Final Challenge. Navinda, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. And maybe to introduce us to your role, this is uh, sort of advanced uh, robotics, uh, you're dealing with drones and also the analytics. Maybe talk us through to DARPA uh, itself and sort of the process, because it's a bit of a story. We can go in various ways, but maybe just introduce us to the challenge itself and maybe the who you were up against, because coming second was quite a big deal. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, DARPA, as you mentioned, is the uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So it's the uh, premier uh, defense research agency in the US, funded by the US government. Uh, and they have a history of setting fairly formidable challenges in robotics for, for the last 20 odd years. Where, uh, some of the very early challenges in autonomous driving uh, literally kicked off the whole in, uh, autonomous vehicle industry. Uh, and uh, more, more recently, they've had uh, other challenges re related to robotics, um, for example, inspired by the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Uh, that was the DARPA robotics challenge held between 2013 and 2015. And the, the latest iteration of that is the DARPA subterranean challenge, which ran for three years from 2018. Uh, and the, the challenge was about sending a fleet of robots into completely unknown underground environments where you don't have GPS, you don't know where, uh, where you are. Uh, it's an extremely harsh environment for radio communication. So there's no guarantee that you'll be able to connect to your robots. Uh, and uh, the uh, the types of environments that they had, they, they were classed into three categories, uh, man-made tunnels, uh, like mining tunnels, uh, underground urban, such as subway and sewer systems, um, and uh, various industrial infrastructure underground. And then the third category was natural caves. So each of these environments have their unique challenge elements in terms of traversability and being able to send various types of mobile platforms into these spaces. Uh, so we had to solve all those challenges and the actual, the actual task, um, uh, sounds simple enough. It's almost <laughs> like a, a Easter egg hunt. Uh, so they, they hide, uh, they, they, hide, they place a number of predefined artifacts, 10 classes of artifacts, um, in this, co in these courses, uh, and you have one hour to send your robots because you can't send humans in, uh, only the robot ca robots can go in. And the other caveat is only one human supervisor is allowed to connect to a computer that can potentially communicate with the with the robots. So you, within this one hour, you need to uh, find these objects, uh, identify the correct class of the object. Uh, and so it's a classification problem and a localization problem. So you need to locate, uh, uh, send back the accurate location of this object back to the uh, base station and then the human supervisor will verify that send it off to the DARPA scoring server and if it's correct you score a point and the, and these objects are a representative of what you'd find in the aftermath of a natural disaster or industrial incident so you have uh, thermal mannequins representing human survivors you have uh, backpacks uh, you have hard hats you have climbing rope you have mobile phones you have um, fire extinguishers handrails, uh, pockets of high concentration of carbon dioxide, air vents, and, and that, yeah. that sort of thing. So is, and just on the identification of the objects, are you using sort of AI and video analytics to automatically detect that that's a person, that's a phone, or that's a device, or you know, a, a, an object of some kind? But again, the system is autonomously identifying these or tagging them as what they are believed to be? Absolutely, yes. So out of the 10 artifacts, majority of them are um, able to be identified visually. There, there are a few few things that you can't do visually, such as the carbon dioxide concentration. Yep. Uh, and then mobile phones, they uh, they emit Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Uh, but everything else we did use uh, vision. So our perception system that is common to all of our platforms. So we ended up deploying six agents. So we had two flying robots, 
two track robots and two walking robots. So each of them had very similar perception uh, and uh, they had camera systems that could uh, identify, uh, see uh, or capture images. Uh, but then yes, we, we did use a, a deep learning based um, AI system to, to correctly identify the, the objects before they were sent to the human supervisor for verification. And I noticed um, Dr. Farid uh, Kendall, uh, who's the C CTO and co-founder of Emerscent, which is a, a spin-out, commercial spin-out uh, of uh, CSIRO's Data61. And we have interviewed uh, the CEO of, of Emerscent as well. Uh, so that does the sort of the Mirage sort of mapping of the area as well. Sort of as a ballpark figure, how many sort of off-the-shelf or applications are you using in all of this uh sort of and mounted on top of each other or uh, into interwined yes absolutely so you mentioned emerson emerson is our uh is uh is a company that spun out from our our lab uh, back in 2013 so um uh, farid and stefan used to be my colleagues before they uh spun out yeah. uh, in, into emerson uh so they are also um subcontractor they are a partner in this challenge uh and uh so it's 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 a really nice story here so we we matured a lot of our technologies over the last three years through this challenge. So one of them uh, is our uh, Wildcat Slam technology that's capable of uh, doing uh, doing mapping, uh, uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, and uh, Emerson uh, happens to be one of our early adopter uh, licensees. So they actually use the, the Slam developed in our lab uh, in their hover map product and it is available commercially. So if you, if you want the uh the the same quality of mapping that we used in, in this challenge you can purchase it from uh, uh from from companies like emerson and yep. uh, uh we are we are also in the process of um uh, spinning out a company that specializes in wildcat slam and uh because emerson currently focuses on the aerial domain and aerial autonomy uh, and uh uh, this technology that we've developed, the Wildcat Slam technology, has applications not just in the aerial domain, but in the in the um, the ground robot uh, domain as uh, as we've demonstrated through through this challenge. So that that was a really unique feature in our in our um, entry into this challenge because each of our robots, whether they were flying, whether they were rolling or walking, they used exactly the same Slam algorithm. Yeah, and they were able to uh, do multi-agent Slam share maps. Uh, so that uh, they, they would each each of the agents would know where each of the other agents had been, uh, and that helped us do really accurate um, object localization as well. I think that's the thing: is the the systems themselves or the platforms, whether it's a drone or a robot, it's actually the brains and the smarts and the analytics of the background, which is common across all of them. Is that the case? So your drones and your robots are uh, sort of reporting on the same uh, sort of platform. So yeah, absolutely. So our, our concept was um, uh, heterogeneous platforms and homogeneous sensing. So our our slam, uh, which allowed the robots to build a map and and also um, localize ourselves in the map, that was Wildcat Slam that was running in on all the platforms. Uh, the the form factor was slightly different between the drones uh, obviously because the drones they they have to fly the, the the payload weight has to be slightly lower but they also had a spinning velodyne lidar on the yeah. hover map payload and uh, on the ground robots we had what we call the cat pack uh, which again had a, a very very similar spinning velodyne running wildcat slam and then we also had our perception system which was the camera based object detection system uh, and the algorithm was exactly the same uh, the one that ran on the on the drone uh, and the ground robots and then we used a, a similar exploration algorithm uh, a frontier based exploration algorithm that allows the robots to um, explore these unknown spaces how much uh, computing power and processing is required particularly with the 3D imaging and are you overlaying those two as you say the drones uh, and the robots have slightly different sort of LADAR scanning going taking place do you overlay those uh, as well and yeah how much processing power do you need you can't run this off a simple uh, laptop I'm assuming uh, so uh, even though the hardware form factor is slightly different between the drone and the and the ground platforms the algorithm is exactly the same so the, the wildcat slam slam software is exactly the same so it's producing so we, the same image effectively uh, 
same same maps or what we call same yeah. uh, sub maps because each of the agents would be in in different parts of the environment. Yeah, and and we have. Um, uh, provision for radio communication between the agents. So in, in some cases, uh, the human support at the base station might completely lose contact with the agents in the in the course. But if the agents can kind of see each other or uh, be within radio range of each other, they can communicate amongst themselves and they would share what's called the sub maps. And once they receive the sub maps from each of the other agents, they themselves on board without any intervention from the human support. So they can assemble these sub maps and, and build a build a full map uh, so that they would know where each of the other agents were. So from from a slam technology point of view, each of the agents would be kind of solving their global slam solution on board using the sub maps coming from each of the agents. And in terms of computing power, so our uh, our cat pack that uh, that's on each of our ground robots, they they have um, a Jetson Savior uh, compute payload inside uh, each of them. And that's that's what we use for our uh, SLAM processing and for our object detection. Uh, and then we have another um, Intel i7 based um, uh, compute payload on each of the robots to run our navigation autonomy uh, software. Whereas in, in the, uh, on the on the drones, on the, uh, on the hover map payload, uh, um, we have um, again an uh, Intel i7 based uh, processor for for the slam processing and the object detection is done on a on a Jetson Nano uh, platform on on the on the drones. Right, so they must have a bit of power uh, usage on those as well. Uh, maybe I was thinking first the comms in terms of wind tunnels and the like uh, might be uh, might be difficult to get the comms out, but the the platforms are obviously communicating with each other. They don't need to have internet connectivity they just need is it bluetooth or sort of 5g how do they operate uh, autonomously without communication so uh, comms is hard in, the, in these environments <laughs> good uh, glad to hear i'm uh, glad you haven't solved that <laughs> uh, so uh, to give you an example uh, uh, the, uh, as i mentioned this was a three-year challenge so each of uh, uh, and there, there were multiple uh, circuit events uh, that happened over the last three years in, in each of these identified um, environments. So uh, the, uh, one of the circuit events that we participated organized by DARPA was the uh, the urban circuit event, part of the uh, subterranean challenge. And that was in February, 2020 in Washington state. And it was in a uh, uh, uncommissioned nuclear power plant that was uh, that had its infrastructure mainly underground and that literally had two meter thick lead impregnated concrete walls. Right, yeah so uh, nothing rf gets gets through those uh, so what we learned very early on in the piece was that we cannot rely on communication uh, between the base station and the robot so that's really pushed us to mature our autonomy for each of the robots so the current current paradigm is the human supervisor gives very high level mission objectives to the robots uh, like go explore down this branch of the tunnel uh, and then the robots have uh, enough autonomy and enough uh, capability on board to go go perform that task and if they do happen to go beyond communication range they would still continue doing their mission in finding these objects uh, correctly identifying them getting the location of the objects, and then they would come back to the last known comms location to try and then uh, pump the data back through our communications backbone to the yep. base station. So that's one strategy. The other one is our robots actually do carry communication nodes on board, especially our ground robots, and they can drop these communication nodes along the way to create your own communications backbone. So we do use um, uh, off-the-shelf radios from a, a from a company called Regent based in the US. And they develop these uh, radio modules to work in underground mining environments. So they, they already are fairly capable uh, in terms of dealing with uh, this sort of um, harsh environment. So they, they operate in both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz yep. range and they, they have um, some sophisticated um, software that uh, kind of hops between these, these frequency channels. Because the they're channel. pretty open frequencies those, but do you have multiple uh, forms of comms as well? I mentioned sort of Bluetooth and 5G, but you mentioned then sort of obviously the RF and radio frequencies as well. Can you sort of bounce around different 
forms of communication if needed? Uh, so underground, we do not use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, as modes of communication, but we do use that to identify objects. So for example, the mobile phones that they have underground uh, as part of this challenge, they emit uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And uh, we use um, a, a Wi-Fi sniffer uh, to, right. to try, try and locate uh, look at the mobile phones but we are not relying on that as a mode of communication yeah. but it's still handy to do particularly if it is a sort of disaster and you can detect phones you might detect a person these days uh, yes. as well that's the idea right um anything else that falls out i noticed the team's tracked robots were purchased by the australian robotics company uh is it bia5 if i'm saying that correctly how many spin outs are coming out of this uh we've we've already mentioned emerscent uh any any others that are coming out and uh the next one is how advanced is this you've come second in a, in a global darpa uh competition which is you know world leading and you've beaten the likes of sort of columbia uh and the like so this is pretty advanced uh autonomous robotics in play here yeah uh, yes. So, um, so you you mentioned uh, spin out. So, and then collaboration. So, uh, we we at Cyro we have um, I guess different modes of trying to get our IP out uh, out into the world and then uh, allow other people to use it. So, Amazon is a great example where we uh, spun out a company to to commercialize uh, drone autonomy. Uh, and and more recently, um, what we've done is we we've, we've matured our uh, Wildcat Slam technology, which I mentioned earlier, and we are um, in preparation to spin out a company to commercialize Wildcat Slam. Uh, but in in the meantime, we also do licensing. So what we've done is we've set up an early adopter program, not just for our Wildcat Slam, but also the the Cat Pack hardware, the the hardware that sits on top of. Uh, uh the the ground robots that performs uh the object detection and slam so we we uh we are licensing this out to a number of companies and we have a, a brisbane based company called automap uh, who's one of our uh, um, early adopters and you can go to automap and purchase one of these uh, cat packs and and have the same uh, or similar capability that our ground robots had and we did collaborate with uh uh, with BIA5, uh, which is a uh, Brisbane-based company that manufactures these track robots, and we purchased those robot uh, platforms from them, and then we, uh, I guess, rebranded them, uh, gave, gave the robots our, our um, uh, perception capability, our navigation capability, and the autonomy to perform uh, uh, multi-agent uh, multi tasks. And in terms of the, the very formidable uh, competition that we had, uh, so in the, in the end, uh, in the final event, uh, had a, a lineup of eight uh, eight teams, and uh, they they comprised of the the heavyweights in in field robotics and AI. Like we had the likes of uh, uh, NASA Jet Propulsion uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, uh, MIT, uh, and uh, that that uh, that were in the mix. And we had uh, the Carnegie Mellon uh, University. Uh, they they also are very uh, formidable in the in the field robotics domain, and then the team that came first uh, was called Team Cerebrus, and they uh, they were a combination of um, ETH Zurich, uh, um, University of Oxford, uh, uh, and University of Nevada Reno, uh, and the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and, and a, a Swiss company called uh, Flyability. So, in the end. <laughs> We tied for the top uh, top score. Uh, wow. So we, we tied for uh, twenty three points uh, with the uh, with, with Team Cerebrus, and uh, that, that's when they had to invoke the tiebreaker rules to <laughs> find <laughs> out uh, who scored those twenty three points the fastest in the one hour. So period. it came down to time after that. Yes, so we missed out by about forty six seconds, oh. uh, and uh, that's that's a very narrow margin if you consider you know, one hour time frame but we're, we're still very happy with uh with this with this outcome because we had an opportunity to really showcase australian technology in a, on a global yep. scale well i would have come down to then things like the power used uh the processing required you know i would have, I would have put a few more there than just time uh because again if you've done it more efficiently but you know 46 seconds crikey that's like almost winning second at the olympics missing out by 
split second, really. How long? Yeah, and how long? I suppose how long was that? Forty? Did you say forty six seconds? Yeah. Yes. So how how long was the exercise to to be nipped at the by that uh, much? Uh, Sixty minutes. So it's one hour. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's close. Yeah, and uh, look, it, it was a true photo finish. Uh, and uh, but still, we, we we are very happy with the with the way we've um, yeah. we've performed, uh, and uh, what we wanted to do was th this was this was a marathon like this was a three year mm. three year project. And, <laughs> and to lose uh, by forty six seconds yeah. that's even worse. <laughs> but what we wanted to do was uh, at the end what I was telling the team as well, like, uh, regardless of the ranking, let's come out of the final event. Uh, having had the best run that we've ever had yeah. in the competition. And that's exactly what we did. Like all the technology came together, things worked as designed. The system system worked, system worked yeah. as designed. And we we had the best ever run that we've had in the past three years in the final. And then that's that's where it counted. And then I think that's what matters. How, how much did you two sort of, I, I count you as equal winners. I think it's the best way to go. Uh, how much did you, did you beat the other teams? Was there a gap, or were the all the all those six teams coming in pretty close? Uh, so, uh, if I remember correctly, the top two scores uh, between the first and second was twenty three, and then uh, the third uh, was uh, eighteen points. That was uh, Team no. Marble. That was a combination of University of uh, Colorado Boulder and University of Colorado Denver. And then the fourth place was seventeen points. That was Carnegie Mellon. Right. Uh, so you, yeah. Well, you came out quite strongly, the two of you. And that the other team, the winner there was was all Swiss. You mentioned there was a couple of Swiss companies, but was that the whole team was Swiss? Uh, so the prime there was University of Nevada Reno. That was uh, a US based That's university, US, but, okay. the, but, but the but the core technology actually came from uh, uh, from uh, from ETH Zurich from 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 Switzerland. Got it. And and then uh, then Oxford University was was part of that as well. Okay, well, look, uh, a fascinating uh, sort of exercise there and and challenge. What's the what's the the next challenge? Was this the final? You say in terms of that three year process, that was it in terms of this subterranean challenge. Yes. So in terms of the subterranean challenge, uh, this was the final event. Uh, well, for us, the project still is ongoing. Uh, it goes on till the end of the calendar year. We, we still have to submit final reports and things like that. But in terms <laughs> of the challenge, y yes, uh, that, that's uh, that's the uh, conclusion of that. Uh, but we are hoping for well, to compete in whichever uh, robotics challenge that DARPA announces in the future. Would you say that you're operationally ready? So if there is a major disaster, you are ready to go? Uh, so let, let me put it this way. So for, for this to work, we had to develop so many component technologies. It was just not just one thing that we had to do. And, and uh, various aspects of what we've developed has different levels of maturity. Uh, so for example, the Wildcat Slam technology, extremely mature. We are about to uh, spin out a company there. Uh, the next one that we are currently focusing on to mature is our navigation stack. Uh, and that's the multi-agent navigation stack. So we are in the process of maturing that. Then we have um, an underlying uh, multi-agent communication system that we've developed. Uh, apart from the actual um, uh, physical hardware, we've developed a framework that can deal with um, uh, kind of lossy networks, resource constraint, bandwidth constraint communication. So that in itself has, has value. So most of these technology components have uh, multiple use cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are already in conversation with uh, with various industry sectors, with industry partners who are really keen on adopting or uh, converting this technology into real world use cases for them. And uh, first responders definitely. Uh, uh, there, there are there's environmental monitoring, forestry, mine rescue, all sorts of sectors, and we are very confident that we'll be able to get this technology translated into real world use cases, which would contribute to saving lives uh, and then yeah. ma making uh, making the quality of life much better for, for humans. As well as applications you probably haven't even thought of yet uh, with some of those, either individually or together or uh, combinations of those. Um, Absolutely. I suppose the last thing is maybe a shout out to the team, uh, how many people were involved and maybe some of those key disciplines 
in this space too is because obviously the, it's the the programming and the integration but anything on the platforms themselves as well or do you find do you all become quite multidisciplinary you can't stick to one discipline or you complement each other what what was the makeup and your a call out to the team uh, it was a very large team effort um, and uh, in, in CSIRO itself we have uh, around 20 people who, who worked on this and then we have our partner organizations um, Emerson and, and Georgia Tech that were crucial uh, for our for our success um, at, at this event and uh, you're right like robotics by nature is, is a very multidisciplinary um, uh, mm -hmm. area uh, and it, it definitely does complement each other and for for, for this type of field robotic deployment, um, where we, we define field robotics as where you have to deploy robots into environments where you don't have control of the environment. And you, you definitely need all the way from uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, electronic engineering, computer science, software engineering. Uh, we need all of the above really like <laughs> yeah. for, 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 for this to work. And we, we had a uh, really talented and dedicated um, engineers and, and researchers, of course, uh, researchers as well, who had to solve uh, really challenging research problems to, to be able to deal with this sort of uh, uh, environment. And can it be automated a little bit like uh, space uh, in terms of the space sort of launches and, you know, they might make mistakes and, and then that helps them with that data, with the data that comes through and they learn. Is that, that's the process. It's just a continual process of improvement and applying machine learning wherever you can and that automation. So these will only get better and faster. And then you're dealing with the things like the power and the processing and how you can make that all more efficient. Uh, it's quite a long journey, but that's the process that you're in, that process of continual uh, improvement. Uh, absolutely. And that, that's what we've been doing for the last three years as well, because uh, e even here in our lab in Brisbane, we, we do very rigorous regular testing, uh, sometimes multiple times a week, but we uh, we used to do um, very rigorous weekly integration testing every Friday where we try to run as if it is at the competition. Uh, timed runs where we set up a course on our, on our um, lab um, in, in Pullenville in, in, in Queensland. Uh, and we we do very detailed logging uh, and we analyze the data logs after each run, figure out what worked, what didn't work and, and keep fixing. So it was a, a continuous cycle of test, uh, uh, analyze data, improve, uh, and uh, yes, uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Like uh, fig figuring out where the processing bottlenecks are, for example, where are the uh, communication bottlenecks, how can we make processes more efficient? Uh, and, and that's what we've been doing for the last three years. And uh, e even though the pace might slightly slow down given the challenge is over, but going forward, we, we will follow a similar paradigm to mature this technology into uh, into real world applications yeah and last question because i find this fascinating so I, I could keep going all day but um anything that you have on a wish list that you don't quite yet a capability that you think you're either working on or you're thinking oh if we had one more things like i don't know uh, object um, avoidance for the drone or something like that or is there anything that you think oh once we get that uh it's going to be a game changer uh look i think that there are there are lots of uh, little bits and pieces that we can in improve on, uh, but sp specifically in relation, so I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. So specifically in relation to uh, to the challenge and the, and the event that we had, things that we didn't have automated, uh, th there were two things that we didn't uh, automate. One was the, um, the decision to launch the drone. So uh, I don't know whether it was obvious in, in my previous description, the way it worked was our um, track robots, the BIA-5 track robots, they actually carried the drones on their backs when they went into the course. So uh, it was known as a marsupial deployment. So it was carried into nice. the course. Uh, the reason was the, the ground robots had much longer battery life. Uh, they could last for much longer than, uh, than an hour, whereas the drones would have um, uh, less than, say, 20 minute uh, runtime due to, due to the nature of, uh, of batteries and drones. Uh, so once the drones are carried into the environment, 
uh, it was the human supervisor who had to make the decision whether this is a good enough area for you to launch the drone because you need to figure out whether you have enough enough space for the drone and whether it's actually worthwhile whether it's it's a larger cavern with, with higher arcos that might have objects hidden up up top so would be great for us to automate that decision making because we have that information we have the mapping yeah. information we have all of that so that would be an interesting one to automate the other one that we didn't automate was when to drop the communication nodes um, and that was still a human decision that was made so we again have information about the signal quality signal strength and then how much connectivity does each robot have to other robots so that would be another interesting one to automate but from a from a higher level abstraction, from a um, uh, overall challenge point of view, not just uh, this particular underground environment, something that's very challenging for robots uh, is to deal with uh, what's known as deformable obstacles. Uh, think of grass, for example. The, the the typical sensing modalities that we use nowadays will either tell you if you if you're confronted with a grass bush that it's um, it's either an obstacle that you're not supposed to yeah go over uh, or if you have some sort of semantic segmentation using computer vision that will identify it as grass and might tell you oh yeah it's grass you can go over but what happens if there's a big boulder behind the grass bush so yeah. so that 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 sort of problems are not solved in robotics uh, how do you deal with this sort of deformable uh, terrain and environments and uh, how to safely and securely navigate so th those are some of the more media research challenges that we are we're trying to trying to deal with going forward yeah and i think the other the, sort of the video analytics are you using off the shelf video analytics or are you developing that on your own as well uh, so in csro we're lucky to have a, a fairly mature um uh, deep learning based object classification system called right. DNet, uh, that was developed by uh, our colleagues in Canberra, uh, part of Data61's uh, Imaging and Computer Vision Group. So we were using that um, uh, that suite of software for the object classification. Got it. Well, it's a fascinating area. And like I said, I could probably keep going, but uh, we'll keep the uh, the audience wanting more and they can, I'll put the link in with, this is on our drastic channel, our uh, drones and robotics channel. Uh, which stands for drones and robotics and autonomous systems technology intelligence and communication so that's where the drastic uh, acronym came from but we were joined by uh, Navinda Kodajay, uh, Kodajay, uh who is a the group leader uh, and came second in the DARPA challenge for the subterranean uh, sector well done uh, Navinda and well done to the team you nipped by the in the bud by 46 seconds i'm sorry to hear that and uh but also well done to all the participant, participants really uh in such a, an advanced challenge and you were the group group leader so i appreciate your time today thank you chris thanks for having me good on you mate all the best